John, I don't know if you noticed my pointer to um, page 337 of Dr. Beatty's uh, essay from tomorrow. I conceive it to be the duty of everyone who isolates himself by taking his own path of individuation mm -hmm. to tell others what he has found or discovered, whether it be refreshing sp a refreshing spring for the thirsty or a sandy desert of sterile error. The one helps, the other warns. It's become sort of our MO, what we're doing here is to tell our stories. It's going to be an interesting evening because Sandy volunteered to tell her story uh, a week ago and uh, she has quite an intense one. Uh, and Sandy revealed to us last week that she is a psychotherapist in her own right. And so I'm not going to, with no further ado, I'm going to pass it over to you, Sandy, and have you introduce yourself and your story to us. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Skip. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, I'm really grateful for this opportunity, uh, I have to say, because I haven't actually found a stage, the proper stage to which I have been wanting to kind of get this sort of narrative out of me. Um, although I've told my, you know, sort of story to different people, uh, I've only like told them bits and pieces, you know, here and there. And a lot of it was like more intellectually, you know, like isolation of affect. Like I would tell it like a story without having to feel everything. Um, and so having to write it up in terms of a memoir has always been really challenging because I have to really go back and feel a lot of things. Um, so I, I just feel really comfortable with you guys. And I, mainly because I feel like you have um, some background in appreciating, you know, culture and um, the psyche. So, um, in that way, I feel more at ease to, to do that. And it gives me an opportunity to sort of practice saying it, telling the, the sort of story that I've been having in my head ever since I came to um, U.S. So well, uh, we're, on, we're honored to the, that you think we know something about psychology. <laughs> For sure. Okay. Um, and, uh, well, you have a containing function. And yes. that's one of the most important aspects of therapy. Yeah, containment, yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so why, why don't you explain what that is for people who may be watching the, um, the playback of this later, what, what sure. the container is about? Well, a, a lot of different um, clinicians use the concept of a container, but I really like uh, Donald D. Winnicott's He's like a British psychoanalyst and originally a pediatrician who worked with thousands of mothers and babies as a pediatrician and then later went into psychoanalysis. He never mm -hmm. had children of his own, but he understood that the role of the mother is to be like a container, to contain like, you know, the loving and the hateful feelings and to help metabolize their experience for them. Um, and then, you know, in any relationship, you need some degree of containment uh, to be able to hold, help the, the, the listener or the, the attachment figure to be able to hold you, hold you in their mind. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, she's your world in the beginning. Your mother is your world. And, and yes. And, and then it extends to one's culture later in life. Yeah. So I actually, Skip actually was not born in Iran. I was actually born here. Oh, okay. And, uh, and I was about seven, eight months old when I went to Iran. I see. Uh, and then I was, you know, 10 when I came back to America. I see. And I've been there ever since. So that's sort of the big picture of the sort of, sequence um have you ever been back since 
I went back 13 years after I had left. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was interesting. My siblings were, my siblings were older and, you know, they were like young adolescents age. And we all went, including my mom, we went back for 13 years to the old house for a month. And then I went back maybe one more time after that in 2005. My dad is a filmmaker in Iran. Ah. Yes. And during that month, I helped put subtitles on a movie of his, which, was, which ended up getting rejected because of the way the government is. And I brought the movie here and it's under my name, but I haven't had the, I haven't wanted to put it out. I haven't wanted to put it public because it was shot inside that house, inside our house. And there are metaphors that my dad can't see that I can see the parallels to certain things, certain things that have happened in our family. But so I later admitted to my dad that that's why I never, you know, took the movie to film festivals. <laughs> well, let me first give you guys a background of my mom and dad and how they met real quick. I think that would help. So my mom is half Italian, half Sicilian, and half, you know, American. Her mom is, you know, uh, was born and raised here and maybe like French Canadian or something or a little Scott, you know, history. Um, but she's an American, her mother's an American and her fa and my mom's father, my grandfather is Sicilian. So we're all 57 varieties typically, but you can carry on. <laughs> yes. And and so my mom grew up in a really, you know, she was born and raised Catholic and with a Sicilian father. So there was a lot, he had a temper and there were five children. So I think she was trying to sort of get away from home when she met my dad, who was here studying film and, you know, needing a green card. And so they met and they agreed after three months to get married. And uh, about a year later, a year and a half later, I, I was born. And uh, my, this was right when the Iranian revolution happened, was happening. And most people are escaping Iran during this time. But because my father had such a deep attachment to his parents uh, that he wanted to, he wasn't planning on staying in America. Come hell or high water, he was going to go back to Iran. It's mind blowing because everybody's fleeing, you know. And the Islamic Republic is coming to power. So he decides to, you know, say farewell to my mom and I and goes back to Iran. And I was about eight, seven, eight months old. Wow. And uh, so I think my mom didn't have any containment and didn't have family support very much here and was a new mom and uh, she was struggling. And I think my dad had sent some people to come check on my mom and I. Um, and they felt that we were not doing so well. Apparently I was just crying nonstop from the mm. time he left. I mean, there are pictures of me just always like, you know, him, him being, a, I holding him a lot, you know, or he's holding me. And so I know that the attachment was really strong. And my mom says, you just would, were crying and not even eating much. 
So my dad tells me he had a discussion with his mother and they agreed that that's our kid. <laughs> and, uh, and so they said, okay, if you're having trouble taking care of her, then why don't you come to Amer Iran? They tell my mom. And so my mom decides to go to Iran, uh, you know, three or four months after that. Wow. And she, she didn't even know where Iran was, you know. <laughs> <laughs> she was trying to run away from her authoritarian father. Only to <laughs> go to Iran. Uh, yeah. So it was a culture shock for her. I'm sure. <clears throat> but we learned to speak Farsi together. <clears throat> so that was, you know, interesting for her and I. And I had, um, I feel like I had an overall very rich experience with my aunts and uncles and cousins and a four story house and <clears throat> my, uh, my, my grandmother being a scholar and a, 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 a OBGYN and a very prolific writer of Muslim lit, uh, literature. Mm. In fact, one of the reasons why they did not flee Iran was because she was trying to argue with the Islamic Republic folks, <laughs> but you, you, using their own text against them. So she had some kind of, you know, she was a theologian and she wanted to <clears throat> continue her work and had a following. In fact, the prime minister of Iran at the time that was trying to basically help alter the Iranian, uh, new Iranian government, uh, which was eventually killed, uh, was um, my grandmother studied under him wow. for 40 years. Um, Boz Agon was his last name. The first prime minister of Iran. So I just had like the most richest, from a father who's a filmmaker to an American mom that's reading me, you know, from the Bible downstairs. And then I go upstairs and my grandmother's reading me from the Quran and my dad is taking me to the film world. Um, and I had lots of cousins in this house and aunts and uncles. I, you know, I just could navigate anywhere and I was, you know, cared for. Yeah, it's not bad for a kid. Yeah. But then there was the war. <laughs> well, there was that, yes. And in fact, my mom at first was, you know, pretty activated by the situation and she was young and sometimes she wouldn't wear her hijab on the street and she's got like red hair and blue eyes and you know looks very American and doesn't speak Farsi very well and she would go outside without her hijab and the, the officers would put a gun to her you know and say what's going on and drag her back home and but she would kind of play dumb and I'm just an American I don't know what's going on so she I don't know how she scraped by all those you know, risky things she did. Um, but, you know, going on top of the roof and saying Magbat Khomeini, down to Khomeini, things like that. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> uh, Talk about asking so, for trouble. I mean, it's a cool story to tell now, but. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, did you see manifestations of the Iran Iraq War at the time? I did. When I got a little bit older, I think I became more aware of what was going on. And when I was in school, I, uh, you know, at some point we had to build a bomb shelter. With my third grade class, I built the bomb shelter. And I mean, we dug it underground, you know, with our bare hands, our classroom, we dug the tunnel all the way through. Wow. And, uh, you know, on the seasons that there was no bombings in the city, we would turn it into a little art museum. 
with lights and underneath so you know inside so it was really enhanced you know and thrilling at times you know for somebody that doesn't comprehend you know the magnitude um but there was one time that um uh a missile hit our street oh i believe my dad had some a kind of uh, temporary mania in that moment, which can happen. My, I was eight years old and my sister was a newborn baby, Sophia. Hmm. And, she was in, yeah, and she was in the crib and my mom and I were in the room and my dad, everybody had left the city to Damovand. Uh, the city of Damavan, where there's not very many lights, you know, and so you can, you can drive there and, you know, they're not going to, mi the missiles are not going to drop where there's, it's all darkness. They're going to drop on the cities. Right. Uh, so people would go out, out of Tehran if they, if they were given warning that there was, you know, there was going to be some, a hit, you know, and so, uh, you know, we heard the siren, you know, announcing you know the you know red yellow red you know and go shelter under sh you know uh and my dad wanted to go on the rooftop the whole, everybody in the house had already left to Damavan. and because it was hard for a, a mother with a newborn baby to get in the car and drive out to the sit to out of the city to the to our farm house you know mm -hmm. so uh we, we stayed and then my dad wanted to go on the roof and my mom said, don't do that. Don't do that. And I said, I'll be damned if you go on the rooftop right now. And I'm, you know, eight years old. And uh, he, he thought it was cool to see the missile fly by. And um, talk about a manic defense. I'm going to, look at the dragon right in the eye you know? um so i wrapped my body around his legs and and i like a snake i held on tight and i um long enough for him to not go up and that's when the missile hit our street oh boy so yeah. you you had a premonition it was coming I, I guess, <laughs> I guess I did. I don't know. Um, so I think what happened was my, oh, okay. So my, my dad started getting my mom involved in the film world. And she started dubbing films and she was a news broadcaster at some point. And she would accompany my dad to hang out with the socialites friends of the film industry, which they liked because she was American. And she had red and it hair. Helped, it, helped his, it helped him because he was so eccentric and kind of Aspergian. <laughs> so he would talk too much or say certain things or you know, uh, and so she would, she would be like the sort of neutralizer and they liked her and, you know, they would keep him out of trouble uh, sometimes. So she, she was starting to make money. And in fact, she started making, she even played in a movie without a hijab. She had a cowboy hat on. <laughs> and, um, and so I think it was good for her. She was finally, you know, feeling really connected. And finally, she had the second baby. And she had a career. And she had family that loved her. And she had friends. And, and uh, her second child. And so things were good. But let me just digress. 
so my dad, uh, we now, we, he has, um, he has, sometimes he has seizures. He has epilepsy sometimes. Mm. And there's a little bit of like, whenever he gets like a narcissistic injury, <laughs> he sometimes has like a frontal lobe type seizure. Mm -hmm. uh, not often, but it can happen if his buttons are pushed to a point. This is all in, this is all discovery really of after having thought about all this, you know. So there was a discussion, argument that my dad and mom had. My mom wanted to go back again to America because she had gone when, uh, with Sophia when Sophia was one uh, and she was just pregnant for the second one, which was a surprise. Uh, she wanted, she went back to us and got us all these goodies and saw her family and came back. And, um, and I don't know if it was like her, her pregnancy hormones or what, but my dad wanted, some of the money to put into a film, another film. And he was always doing that, you know, putting money into films and half of it wouldn't, you know, manifest because of his, you know, Kubrick obscurantist type films. Um, and so she was like, no, it's my money. I made this money. And uh, it got, it got, it got, it got intense the argument and she was pregnant and so I think he what I realize now is that he somehow blacked out and had like a frontal lobe seizure I could be wrong but this is my hypothesis and punched her in the eye Yeah, and this is kind of a cultural thing, too. Sometimes in the Islamic culture, they men tend to, you know, put her in her place type of thing. Um, so he had been raised this way, but had never before laid his hands on her or uh, had, at least as far as I knew, you know, so she was terror terrified by this and when i came home from school she was sitting in a chair like the way i'm sitting and she had her hand like this and i come in from this way and i'm like mommy what's what is it and she's silently crying and you know i'm unbuttoning my cover up you know, school cover up, I'm about taking off my stuff and, and I approach her and I see this massive black eye. And I just fall to her knees and cry. And you know, who did this and she finally says, you know, reluctantly, you know, daddy. And I think that's when my whole world shattered. Because I was a real daddy's girl. And I really, really, really loved my dad a lot. And so I ran upstairs and I, to where he would have tea often with my grandma and grandpa in the afternoon. And I sitting around having tea and talking and I ran up there and I, you know, kind of had him sit in the chair and I basically insulted him as much as I could in a very adult type manner. And, you, were, uh, you were eight at this point. I was, I was nine. Nine. And he just had a smile on his face. Uh, 
part of him looked like he was proud of me for being so bold. Another part of, I think he just was like being like the Joker, just can't, can't control his laughter, you know? Can't, you know, doesn't even comprehend the magnitude. So then I, I felt different. Um, and I, I blocked a lot of this part, uh, which was uncovered in my 10 year analysis which was that, uh, well, I had convinced myself that I really didn't know why I went with my mom and I thought I was going to Disneyland. That's why we left. Uh, I didn't think I was leaving everybody. Uh, but my dad at some point said, you wrote me a letter <laughs> telling me that I'm being punished. Wow. And you knew what you were doing. When when did when did he write you this letter? I had left him a letter. Oh, okay. Which I'll get to that part in a second. But I'm just saying that I had really repressed this part that I'm about to say, um, which was that I was very angry and shocked, and um, my mom came to me and said. Uh, what do you think about us? I want to, I want to leave. I want to go to America. I want to leave. And uh, I think I just said, okay, I, let me know. Let me know. And I'm going. It's kind of trying to support my mom, you know, and like her, her individuation as it were. So she when she was uh, 19 years old, uh, she met my dad at 22 and was married by 23 and had me by 23. But she was, when she was 18, she had converted from Catholic to Mormon. Somehow because they provided her some kind of social support. And I think she was kind of a little bit of an oddball too, uh, kind of somewhere on the spectrum, I would say, Sight slightly. She asked that she wrote a letter to the Mormon church and said, I'm being held hostage. And then they arranged a plot, a plan to get her out. Because the father has to authorize the, the, the mother to take the kids, you know, in Iran. Mm -hmm. The children belong to the father. So how are we to leave? So this, the guy who was hired was the same guy who helped the woman from the movie Not Without My Daughter. You mm -hmm. know, that movie. Yeah. The same man was hired to facilitate monies and tickets and fake documents to get us out. I remember going to his little office once at night. Me and my mom got on a couple of taxis and, you know, she's still pregnant at this point. And there's a baby, my sister, she's two. So this is, this is Sophia that's two? Yes. Okay, and then there's another pregnancy on the way. Yeah. Okay. So all of this got arranged because we had to get out before Esau was born because then there would be a need, a need, need for another document for another child to leave with his mother. So time was of the essence. And so we got everything arranged. And I think the day that uh, my mom gave me the heads up, I 
went, came home from school and she said, we're, we're, we're going, you know, this afternoon. Because, you know, kids could accidentally spill the beans. So she really just told me like, you know, a few hours before. And so I went upstairs to say goodbye to my grandmother and she was praying. So I, and I didn't want to say goodbye, you know, in that way. So I, I left, I went back downstairs. And then I went up the street to my best friend's house and I said, you won't see me anymore. I'm going to give you my jean backpack that my mom brought from America. Mm. And she said, okay, thank you. Uh, and I didn't tell her, I said, you just won't see me anymore. And she really got the point and she came back down and gave me a banana necklace. At the time, bananas were really scarce in Iran. It was, a, it was like the most sacred necklace. Mm. And so she gave me the, she came back knocking and she gave me this banana necklace and, and, uh, we, we, we walked a couple of miles. It was a windy evening, five o'clock. We needed to, we needed to be there. We need to, we needed to be, you know, at my mom's friend's house, you know, and then go to the airport. So we left around four or five o'clock and that's when my dad comes home from work too. So maybe like in an hour or so he would have come home. So we walked uh, a couple of miles with a stroller and just grabbing whatever we could last minute. And, oh, don't forget your shoes. And oh, don't forget, you know, don't you want this? And you know that, you know, so it was rush, rush. And she was real pregnant, like eight months, more than eight months pregnant. And you're not even supposed to fly. Right. Like so she, you know, we walked with the stroller, Sophia, it was such a windy evening and the wind was going against us, you know, uh, as though really trying to stop. I mean, it was so windy. I felt like I was being blown back, you know? So we get to this taxi station and then we then drive to my mom's friend's house who was an American who had married an Iranian man. Her name was Joyce. And so she helped my mom. And so she, she was, she had the suitcases there and took the, we, we got there to Joyce's house and then we went to the airport. I remember as I was, we were walking to the taxi station. We, uh, my mom said, are you sure you want to do this? Uh, you know, you can't read and write in English. You know, you're almost a so fifth grade. So your mother is asking you if you want to leave for America. I mean, we're like en route, you know, walking. Mm -hmm. And she says, she's, she's, she's starting to get dysregulated. She's starting to get the feelings. Are, she's panicking a little. She's feeling very frustrated. Even when we were packing, she was, you know, like in a bad mood and you know, being kind of short tempered and all that. And so she was agitated, you know, and so she says, are you sure you want to do this? You know, you know, you can't even read. We're crossing this in the middle of the road as we're crossing a main highway. She, she says this to me. And I'm like, I said, yes, I'm sure I'm fine. I'll, you know, just continue. And then Another time when, the, when we're in the airplane and we haven't taken off yet, she starts crying. And, you know, like, mommy, what is it? You know, and you just can tell she's just so sad to leave. You know? And that's right when I know my dad. She says, look at the clock. And she says, he's home now. So I, we take off and, do you, you know. Do you think your dad knew you were leaving? No, he didn't know. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew. We get to America and we go to my uh, mom's sister, oldest sister's house, who has nine kids and is Mormon. Wow. wow. 
we stay there for six months. Two weeks later, my brother was born. We, we were leaving. That windy day was Pi Day. 314. Oh, Pi Day, yeah. And what, what year was it? 89. What is Pi Day? Just, oh. just Pi, 314. Three, March 14th. 3.1416 is Pi, right? Is the number Pi. So March 14th is called Pi Day. Yeah. I, I've, I have Pi Day in my history elsewhere also. <laughs> <laughs> But I won't, I won't digress, carry on. So we, we, you know, my, my brother was, my brother was born two weeks later and I was the first one to hold him and in the, in the hospital, uh, when they handed Esau to me, they, I just felt like so sad because that was my father's firstborn son. And I knew that he was, Esau was not going to be able to experience my dad and the whole entire culture. And, and, uh, and my dad would not be beholding Esau either and seeing his son. And so I just felt like I was like an adult at that point. And I'm like, I said to myself, I will take the place. Hmm. He didn't quite appreciate that, <laughs> my brother. <laughs> so a few years later, he didn't appreciate. Yeah. It. <laughs> uh, so, so, yes, I, you know, was uh, kind of parentified and had to take care of these babies in the house, and and my mom was not feeling well after that she was she was having a great depression and a very you know um she struggled a lot uh, you know after this after esau was born and having no not a lot of support from the family that she had here and not anything like she had in iran and uh she was a stranger in a strange land even though she was american she hadn't been here for 10 years mm. So she was culture shocked a second time. Yeah. And uh, so that was very damaging to our relationship, which was relatively pretty good in Iran. Uh, you know, I was, I, she saw me like my, she saw, she, like I was my dad at that point and all of her anger, hurt, resentment and, everything was projected onto me put onto me mm -hmm. and so that was very very rough because i at that point had no parents essentially was containing in any way and i was a second parent in the house and that was another bone of contention because on one hand i'm the child on the other hand i'm feeling like a parent and so this gave rise to a lot of conflict. So my siblings grew up and my mom had somewhere in the middle, she had a uh, heart surgery. So she would never worked a day here, just took care of the kids and, you know, really, really struggled and was on, you know, government support and that was it. So I started working at age 14, you know, and trying to, pay for things and such. Uh, and I, in my mid twenties to late twenties, I went into analysis. I had started working with children in my profession as an educational therapist and happened to then decide to do train in psychotherapy. And I had a, analyst that was a child analyst supervisor for my hours uh, who said that, you know, uh, he thought it would be good for me to, you know, have an analysis and that I would, you know, like it. 
so I started an analysis in my late twenties. And uh, was that with a with a Jungian or what was the background? No, it was a it was a a very uh, orthodox um, psychoanalyst who was actually a, a tr in training. He was younger and he was training. He was a psychiatrist and was training to as a you know contemporary you know analyst but but had to do the four times a week and had to do it formally in order to graduate from from being a psychoanalytic candidate so i was a control case as they call it um so i did that for many many years and tried to kind of move forward from this trauma of really feeling very parentified with my siblings and so I, I thought I worked through that uh, until my sister had a baby <laughs> and he had a birth injury and his whole head was got a stroke and um, and uh, they said he might not you know live or he might be CP or cerebral palsy or blind and things like that so I just rushed back into you know being a you know acting like a parent and that instinct that was like too strong and not my role anymore got reactivated and uh i dropped everything to attend to my nephew and sister because i'm trained in sort of brain development so i, I know all the programs to sort of to help somebody who's had a stroke, especially a baby. And I had studied infant mother and I had worked with children that had learning disabilities or strokes and things like that. So I was very familiar with what needed to be done. And I was at the end of my hours, my, my MFT hours, and I dropped all of that and didn't turn anything in. And then I just attended to my sister, my nephew, who is like very attached to me and, um, and all of those original feelings were activated again. Even the experience of Sophia being born in, in Iran and having my grandmother and, and all those things that my grandmother taught me about how to take care of Sophia and the way to put her to sleep, the way to play with her and the songs that we sang, she would, would sing for Sophia and me. And so I was doing this for my nephew, Hafez, and as my sister kind of watched and kind of mirrored and so on, because I wanted almost to give it back to Sophia, the thing that I took from her. What I have to say is in my analysis, my analyst had the hardest time getting me to not feel immense guilt for having taken them from their father. Mm -hmm because I could have stopped my mom because I, in fact, did try to punish my dad and, and all of that. So that was really, really, really rough on me to experience that guilt. I, I couldn't quite shake it, uh, but it came in the form of just frustration, anxiety, and anger. I think my siblings picked up on that. I think when my when I was worried about my nephew and and the injury, I, I felt like I felt like it was a return of the repressed. I felt like my sister was regressed to a point of a two year old when she was in labor, mm. and this was one of the reasons why the birth did not happen properly. She couldn't quite she didn't quite have the faculties to um, command what she needed from the doctors and was resistant to even having any family member come and help her. So I, again, felt utterly responsible for the injury that occurred even to my nephew. But this time it burned a hundred times more because, you know, when I held that baby, just something happened to me. And as an adult to hold the baby before I was holding these babies, I was a child. So this time I really could feel the double dose of trauma that crashed on this baby and I think my own identifications with that baby in some way mm -hmm. 
So he's now five years old and doing great. Okay. Right now. Yes. Right now. My nephew is now five and doing great. I feel like I'm a grandmother, but I don't have kids. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it's, you know, just supporting the dynamic and with my sister and she's the mom and she's, it's her child. And I, I need to not act like the parents and, you know, she has to sometimes tell me I can't come over and, you know, cause she's the mom. And, uh, so this is the same problem I had with my own mother. <laughs> I'm the mom. I'm like, but, but I'm going to have to fix everything later. You know, so, um, a really, really tough position for me to be in. Uh, but I have learned a thing or two about child rearing and even teaching parents how to parent. <laughs> um, and so that's my specialization. Mm. Um, I did do four years of psychoanalytic training as well when I was in analysis and I'm continuing to do that. And I published some papers in the psychoanalytic, you know, literature, you know, journals and stuff. Uh, but I haven't done any work in talking about this story. I, I've been very over, my defenses are very, in, I do a lot of intellectualization and I'm very cerebral and um, I try to sort of, you know, not, not get too primitive because there's just so much there <clears throat> that it would be hard for me to, you know, function if I wasn't, you know, very like analytical. Otherwise, I really wouldn't have done this at this moment. I feel like I can relate to you all. So I'm like, you know, they can, they can, they're not going to, you know, fall apart or judge me too much or, you know, things like that. No, not at all. Yeah. We've all, so, we've all made uh, mistakes with our siblings over the years, no, no doubt, probably. Yes. We will love you more for sure. What's that? We will love you more for sure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, does anybody have any questions? I, uh, I don't know if I need to add anything or, um, I, I will have to say I, I, I have lots of feelings about religion, uh, <laughs> because of, um, my mom, you know, her religion and my dad's and a lot of that, um, a lot of those restraints, given the fact that I was under such stress my whole life. Where did I leave off? Well, you, yeah, you had feelings about religion. religion. Yeah. Fe yes, I, I have, um, I have, I have a, a resentment of sorts because of uh, my the way my dad is now overly studying the Quran uh, but he doesn't want to apologize for his actions uh, and 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 also my mom you know kind of being rather indoctrinated by certain aspects of the Mormon church where also my sister is uh, active and I feel like I I can't compete with like all those people because they have a little formula of support where I'm just a single person trying to support them uh, and I shouldn't be held accountable to religious standards um, and, and I have my I'm kind of like a little dervish you know spiritual type of person and I like to be private about it. I don't like to showcase and talk about God or talk about, you know, um, you know, formulaic morale. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I have like this kind of more of a Zoroastrian philosophy to myself and, and I, it's been very difficult to, you know, um, feel accepted. For example, you know, on Easter, my mom didn't touch base with me. My sister didn't touch base with me. And I'm like thinking, you guys are the ones who are, you know, uh, this is your ritual, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I just really wanted to see my nephew, but at the same time I, you know, or Christmas or certain holidays where 
they assume that I've taken a position of anti, you know, and, and I just simply just don't like to categorize myself. I mean, my dad's Muslim, my mom was Christian, now she's Mormon. I mean, it's just so different. And I, I've just been a sort of a, you know, trying to ha follow the sort of uber bench <laughs> philosophy. Oof. And I'm like, you know, if, if it, it, it just, I'm going to have to just, you know, it's my, it's the hero's journey and I deeply believe in it. And, you know, I don't want to be judged because I already feel very morally responsible for many things on my own accord without having been told I'm supposed to follow, you know, a certain way. So morality for me is a very interesting thing. And I think it's a very private thing and I don't like it to be expectations to be put on me when I already hold myself to standards, which burden me often enough. Mm -hmm. So that's some of my story. How do you all feel about hearing it? One thing I'd like to know is, how do you feel about the concept of home with that kind of upbringing? What really feels like a sense of home for you? The sense of home for me is when everybody is under the same roof. Everybody that I love is under the same roof. Uh, and I, I've been, I have felt homeless since I left Iran. I lost so many cousins, so many friends. It was like a genocide, you know? Are you still in touch with a lot of those people? Um, my mom is, and sometimes, but it was such a shock and trauma to all of us that even talking on the phone reactivates the the pain immensely. I think my father and the family in Iran were just as traumatized by the loss. And I could feel it in through, you know, from across the planet. I could feel, sometimes I couldn't tell if I was feeling my dad's pain of loss of all his children and his wife and then that form or or it was my own pain or if it was my brother and sister's pain that they didn't even know what they were missing uh i couldn't tell the difference it was it was sometimes it was more of feeling my my dad's pain and just feeling so, so tragically heartbroken for him. That my mom thought very much that I was too much identifying with him. On the phone, he would say, okay, you're my eyes and ears now. And, you know, he, he supported my stepping in his shoes on his behalf. It's also a very Persian thing. You just kind of adopt your daughter as like a, you know, second wife in, in certain fashions, you know, especially if his, my mother's American, you know, I mean, I'm the, I'm blood. I'm, I can, I understand what I need to do for this family. You know, you're our flesh and blood. So you're, you're us, you're doing this for us. You know, you go ahead and take care of the, those kids and, you know, check on your mom and do this and do that. And so I was getting updates on, things that I ought to be doing to supervise them all. Sandy? Had, yes. Sandy, can I ask, um, when you, by the way, thank you so much for, for sharing. And for one thing, um, I have such admiration for you because you're not only, you know, um, a super achiever having gone through the type of childhood trauma you went through and, um, had to support the family, parenthesize and uh, work at, at, at age 14 to keep the family, you know, afloat. And, um, you know, you, you put a lot of energy to hold the family together. 
And I was just wondering when you came here, it sounds like you didn't have very much support coming back. Like oh, when you were in Tehran, you had a wonderful grandmother who you um, adored and put on a pedestal because she was such an accomplished woman, but not only accomplished, but she seems like she was um, a very compassionate, very affectionate kind of grandmother. Yes, she, she took my mother in, even though my mother was not of the same faith. You know, yeah, very tolerant and um, very embracing. And when you came over here, it seems like there was an emptiness, uh, um, uh, no, no support. Uh, you know, uh, you went from one nest, you, you flew over and got into a nest, and you flew over here, and there was an empty nest. There was yes. a, a supportive grandmother to, you know, nurture you folks and, 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 go through the process of healing and being embraced by love. Because as you know, love is the answer to, to everything. Love is the solution. And to be embraced yes. by love, you know, goes a long, long way, especially for children. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you, can you comment on that? What happened to your, your um, maternal grandmother in the picture? Can't hear you. My, oh, yeah, my, my maternal grandmother uh, is a is an Adams. She's related to uh, the many presidents uh, uh, and founding fathers, particularly. She's an Adams. So, but she was not. You're speaking of my mom's mom, right? Right. Yes, so she um, she was not very supportive. I think she had her own uh, issues because of her husband who was Sicilian and was divorced by then and was not was a senior and was not able to support my mom when we returned. But, did you have any, but did you find any like spiritual grounding because it looks like you had a mix of um you know your middle east uh, middle eastern um religious background and then you know the catholic and the mormon you had such a mixture and such a smorgasbord of really choosing which resonated in your heart did you have any yes. one particular no no okay i I just wanted to stay away from the, 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 which I didn't think was really supportive in, in a dynamic way, which was my mom who was in the Mormon church at the time. Okay, so it, it sounds like, um, well, let me put it this way. Did, did the therapy, the analysis help you? Did you find that beneficial? Yeah, the analysis is, was definitely containing. Um, okay. And it was very right. non-judgmental and and i found my i found my comfort in the analytic community uh amongst people that were you know had been in the holocaust or had survived it and had stories to tell about their immigration and um and the depth of the psyche and and so i really felt like i had the genetics and the history and the stories to be able to kind of get myself to relate to them and then relate to me. And, and that was really, you know, the friends I found in the, in the analytic community. I wanted to say something here to you. I, um, your name is Gazel and it is making sense to me so much right now. Like it is, it, it is when when I I listen to you. It, it, everybody don't get puzzle <laughs> here. Yes, yes that, and uh, that was and, very traumatic for me when uh, they couldn't say my name or didn't understand it when I came here. Yeah. Uh, and just me not relating to others' names and 
them not understanding the meaning of my name or being able to pronounce it. So I had an American cousin that was looked like a Barbie doll. So her name was Sandy. And I couldn't tolerate hearing them butcher my name. So and did Kush did Kushpoo get it right? Yeah, well she's saying it in her dialect, but because she knows the meaning, it's fine, you know. Um <laughs> Yeah. Tell and, so yeah. tell us the meaning. You you sent the information about uh, Emre, I believe, but um, t tell us the meaning of Ghazal. Um, Ghazal is Ghazal. a type. Yeah, it's a type of Persian poetry. Is a type of Persian poetry uh, that each verse, each each verse is like a pearl on a string of pearls. It has its own meaning uh, mm -hmm. on its own. But as you read the whole poem, it's like a string of pearls that comes together. But it essentially, it's the kind of a longing for your big other. Longing for your, your long lost, either it could be, you know, the source or God or your lover. That you that you're not close, you're not in contact with you. They're they're far away. You're longing for them. Yeah. That's the that's the meaning of of the poems. And I, I had a uh, another feeling while I, I was listening to you about. Uh, uh, about the fatherly the aspect of life, Some, somewhere I was able to resonate with you over there. That I don't know, daughters, uh, daughters or, or women like, can. I know a lot of lot of young women who just took their father's responsibility, like like some divine uh, act of God, and um, I see that. I see that here, and I see. I also, I also can feel the the, um, the, the pain which uh, which flows through that process of not being that what you don't have. Like it is, um, it is, it is there has to be a, a role of a divine. Then only it can happen, bringing something out of. Uh, emptiness and I think you have done a mm. uh, marvelous marvelous job job that it, it I just wanted to express that it needs a um, divine intervention otherwise it's not it's like I have done I have seen so many people who couldn't make through the journey without losing their uh, uh, part of their um, their being, their their whole whole universe, their whole light, the, the stars and moons of their universe, and and the, and 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 you built it out of thin air like a magician. It is, it is just God bless you. That I'm sending you a lot of love and blessing. And thank you. In and preparation for this, you. thank you. In uh, in preparation for this, I had a dream that I went to Iran and the house was rebuilt because it has been rebuilt. And I felt like I was like this kind of dervish. I've been watching this show about Yunus Emri, which is this Turkish poet of Ghazals. And uh, he was training as a, as, a, as a dervish, as a dervish 750 years ago. And I've been watching this, this show and the guy and the mo the main character looks just like my dad. Mm. Uh, and even my dad type of movies, my dad's played in and the way he dresses up that way. So I just, he just got into my psyche and I dreamt that I was like Yunus Emery and I was going back to Iran and I had like this cane and I was climbing up the hill to go to my house and ring the doorbell. And um, I looked across the street and there was like, um, new cement like like six feet more of cement on top of the old street 
uh, and then the middle of the road, there was like a two inch gap, like where the, you know, ditch is, which went really deep into the earth. And I thought if there's any kids around, they would fall in. Uh, um, but anyhow, I walked up to the house and a, a young couple with a baby, like a seven month old baby with blonde hair came out and greeted me. And they said something like, oh, are you looking for your grandmother? She's moved out a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And are you looking for your aunt who also helped raise you, which she lives in Irvine, but, uh, and, I, and I, and she said, she's on vacation and she's abandoned the home. She hasn't, she's not gonna be back for a while. And there was nobody, nobody else home. Um, so I left and tried to explore the city and it was filled with several millennials who were, you know, acting very Western and there were no seniors. There were no older people. They were just having fun partying. And I got lost in that mix and was just observing those, the new Iran, uh, uh, I had many, many associations to this dream, uh, which was really interesting. I also had like dream paralysis. I couldn't wake up from the dream for an hour or so. Uh, it was like in this like migrational purgatory to get back to America <laughs> and in my room. I, could, I was in my room, but I couldn't wake up. Wow. So that was really, and, I, and that was a dream I had and, and and knowing that I was going to be talking about this. I had the dream the night I read the, the madness article. <laughs> oh, Dr. John Bishop. Bishop, Paul Bishop's article. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I had just woken up and it was like eight in the morning to like, on, you know, to, to have the meeting here. And, and I was, I just had woken up from this dream. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, um, Sandy, I, one of my values and what I've been doing for the last four years is not to think or suggest that I'm doing mental health here, okay, because I, I know I'm not qualified. Um, and so what I can do is just uh, talk about some things that you know, I wonder about a bit in terms of your story. Um, and I might connect it into something I've read in Dr. Young's work, but um, I'm, I'm interested in, you mentioned Zoroastrianism and you only mentioned it once though. And I, I was wondering how you, um, how you interacted with Zoroastrianism. I, it so happens that I have a, I have had over many years a very deep relationship with the Parsi community in India. And the Parsi community are all Zoroastrians, of course. That's what they are. They, they're a, a group of people that actually came from Iran a thousand years ago. And uh, they still practice Zoroastrianism. Mm, uh, well, you know, uh, Many, many Iranians in the West and in Iran as well are, uh, they like to think of themselves as Zoroastrian, um, but you know, like sort of the modern day um, essence of it. They take a lot of pride in it. You know, they wear the thing and they, um, you know, sometimes they're so angry at the Islamic Republic and they're destruction of you know the persians and their individual differences that they like to really now exhibit that they are zoroastrian mm -hmm. um but my my understanding is that underneath all of the you know even the current you know main religion in iran they are all also very zoroastrian because mm -hmm. of the way that they worship nature. Mm -hmm. um, Which is a very, um, very 
I don't know, nature oriented. I mean, all the fire things that are in it and that sort of thing. Of course, Zarathustra was a Zoroastrian. <laughs> long ago, um, long ago. So, so where, like my hometown is the place where uh, Surat is the place when, where the Parsi community like came first, uh, approached the yeah. the king. Yeah, that that's my hometown. Like it. Mm, wow. Hometown. Yeah. Wow. And, um, and and we like we when we were we were, when I was, I was a child, I was so my mother was a school founder of a school, a community school, and and she she was into all of this. Like everybody tells me, like I'm like her, and it makes sense to me, like totally like, with the light and a shadow aspect of it. So so I remember the story which she 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 told us, um, like lot of other children along with me and and it was like so so when when the ship arrived and and uh, 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 Parsis uh, approached the king and approached like uh, and they approached like how will you fit in in the in in the in the community where um, uh, where all the like Muslims were there and uh, Gujaratis Gujarati Hindu who is like a big business community of the Hindus kind of business wing of the Hindu community, you can say that way. They are a very entrepreneurial in nature. So so they asked, so um so in Gujarat we have a tradition that we mix uh, sugar sugary stuff in our most of the food, like ninety nine percent. Um uh, that time it was jaggery, not sugar, sugar, the way we eat it. So 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 they were when they arrived, they were offered a glass of milk. Everybody was offered a glass of milk. So the representative of of the Parsi community who who arrived there, he he poured that uh, the sugar sugar uh, sweetener which was given for to mixing in the in the milk as per their choice. They said we are like this, and we will um uh, uh we, yeah we will. How, how how what is the english word for it we will uh, we will melt into the whatever material which we were given and we will sweeten it the way uh-huh. it is so so that 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 is the story and and then king was quite impressed with the way they approached the entire situation like they they were not saying that we won't be different but they were very confident and and very determined in in saying that we'll make things sweeter because we we are coming and because we are melting in uh, uh, in, in 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 this community and that is how that is how everything started and and it it just it just makes sense it it it, it just makes sense because uh, the way everything happened after that and the the, the historical plateau of it uh, is is quite significant and and uh, as per the Indian I'm sorry, I'm digrating from you, but uh, uh, Sandy, uh, forgive me for that. But but, but um, uh, economically, even when uh, British left, it was uh, Parsi community who bought very important uh, structures from the British community for India, like. Uh, uh, losing all their wealth and things like that, so it, they were really instrumental for for the local life after British left. Because whatever government did, they were in in the partition business at that time when the freedom happened in India. This this Parsi community, so that is where the plateau where Parsi community is there. Uh, leaving British was uh, uh, was not not impacted in the life of common people because Parsis took a um, lot of responsibility and I think somewhere down the line I see the same thing reflecting in your your the, the way you your life the way you chose to unfold your life and your energy and everything I, I can yeah I can just, just feel it it is yeah. it is the same thing I, I know that yeah. the 
Parsi community is extreme, very moral and very closely connected. And they, um, they take care of the young people in the community. Um, I, I think they at least put 10% of their income into the community itself, the Parsi community. Uh, they do blend in very well. So, for example, I was saying uh, last week that uh, one of the people that I became very close to uh, is Nader Godrich, who was or is uh, very involved with uh, Godrich Industries. And, and if you go into any Indian household, any Indian household, you'll find some Godrich products. And uh, so they, uh, ex I mean, it's, they're like, uh, somebody compared them to Lever Brothers, but they're much beyond that now. They're into real estate and office equipment and all sorts of other things too. But they're, they're so Godridge itself is like a conglomerate, but, but the Parsi community is like a conglomerate too, which has held itself together for a thousand years, uh, very much like the Jews held themselves together in, uh, for a thousand years. And they, but they fit into the community. So you almost don't notice that they're um, Parsi unless somebody tells you, unless they tell you. Um, and- uh, Wow. And the, um, and there's another there's another group that's in Pakistan that's very similar called the Aga Khanis, the Aga Khan uh, group. And uh, the Aga Khanis also take care of the people in their tradition and, and uh, they have uh, hospitals all over the world in, into um, Africa and various places. But there's some groups like that that have taken great care of um, of their communities in in very moral ways and and mm. uh, and so I, I've always been impressed uh, by them I, I, and I don't mean to suggest that the Aga Khanis are Zoroastrian they're actually Muslim but uh, or a branch of <laughs> Islam but but um, the um, you know I've always been very impressed by that community. Um, and I, I do have an embarrassing story. One time I got a huge package that was about this thick and, and, uh, I was very busy at the time. I was doing a lot of traveling to India. I was going to India every uh, two months for two to three weeks, every two months. And, uh, I get this package and it's from Nader Godridge. And the customs thing on it says catalogs from Godridge Industry. I said, "Oh my God, why do I need cat? Why do I need catalogs from Godridge?" <laughs> and so I left it on my desk unopened for about two and a half months. And finally, one day I broke down and opened it, and what it was was this beautiful, beautiful book uh, about the history of, Zoro, of Par the Parsi community in India for the last thousand years that, wow. have, been, that have been written by Godridge's cousin. I go, oh my God, I didn't thank Nader for this. And I, I finally <laughs> did thank him and he forgave me, but it was, uh, <laughs> it was something. <laughs> yeah. But any, anyway, I, you know, so I have some some uh, soft place in my heart for Zoroastrianism. Anyway, anyway, uh, yes. for for what it's worth, but but let me uh, let others talk. Uh, I I want to add uh, one last thing, Sandy. If the the God permits, if if the opportunity occurs, and and whenever I see you, I'll make all the Parsi recipes for you. You know. Oh, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, yeah, in Gujarat, like, like they're, they're really foodie people and they have, um, uh, they have preserved the original recipe very well. And it is still uh -huh. like part of day to day life. And it is 
it is like thousands year old recipes and i'm oh. it's very dear to me and wow. i'll cook for you I, it's my promise to you okay, okay. <laughs> maybe you can ship something <laughs> <laughs> in india we don't believe in eating uh, cold food cold food cannot be given to god <laughs> really you got to oh. meet me love <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'll say a couple of things. Uh, yeah, I please. Think everything that's been said here has been remarkable. Um, I particularly like what you had to say, Joss, about the way you summarized your understanding of, her, of uh, Sandy's story. Um, so I'll just say a couple of things. You know, when I came to the end of my practice and I, I sat back and I thought, you know, I've seen all of these people over all of these years, and why did they come to see me? You know, what was it? What did they have in common? What were their themes? And probably the one, I think the one at the top of the list was that in some way, I didn't get to have a childhood. And it takes lots of different forms. In yours, I think it was you had to take charge when you probably should have been out playing. Um, and, you know, people carry that way into adult life. And they still think like that. And particularly you put it together with the fact that those things happened when you were nine and 10. Um, the way kids make sense of things at that stage in their life is, I don't understand it. I don't know why this is happening. It must be me. It's my fault. And people carry that way into adult life. And I think the analysis you've been through is really showing you that, you know, it's, it's really opening that. The other thing that struck me is when you told the story of your father, hitting your mother, and you've mentioned seizures, uh, complex partial seizures, people can be violent when they have a seizure, but it's, it tends to be clumsy and non-directed and confused. That was a really direct punch. That, uh -huh. was, not, that was not a seizure. Mm -hmm. He has to take responsibility for that. Yes. Yeah. So those are my and, comments. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. I wanted to just say, Sandy, that you are a beautiful grandmother to the child you <laughs> were. That, yes. that you are you are feeling her feelings. You have spent hours and hours attending to her and what she missed and understanding her story. And I think she's very lucky to have you. Lots of love and compassion for her. And, in you for that child you were. Oh, thank you. That was profound. <laughs> yeah, Nancy, thanks for articulating that. I've, I was trying to formulate something like that in my own mind and you said it perfectly. I totally agree. Yeah. Thank you. I just, uh, okay, can I think? Go I'm ahead, gonna... Cindy. Yeah, go ahead. Um, wow. I have just, I just, I feel like so honored to have been one of, you know, the recipients in this group we have here to listen to your story. Um, you know, just story of your life and what you've been through and, you know, it's real, it's real difficult to listen without um, ricocheting into your own life. You know, when you talked about one of the things, I mean, there were many things that I, I could relate to. And some things I thought, well, you know, I, I don't even remember my childhood. Um, but yet I always feel like I'm a mother all the time and that gets me in trouble. But, you know, when you were, when you were talking about how you get very cerebral, that sometimes it's difficult for you to, or it's challenging, or I can't recall the word, I'm sorry, that you may have referenced, but um, when you were preparing to be able to speak about this, um, that sometimes you get um, very cerebral in how you express yourself and and I apologize if I'm not paraphrasing oh, you correctly. No, you're, I, I get it. Like the isolation of affect. I mean, like with skipping the emotion. <laughs> yeah. So, 
So listening to you, um, I almost feel a little selfish and a little, not, not guilty, but almost like I learned part of things about me just by listening to your story. One in how you articulated your thoughts and your ideas. Um, I mean, it's very profound for me. And I just, I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for sharing. And even the things, you know, that other people here have said, you know, how, how Josh summarized it. Tim said something, Nancy, everything that every, and, and Kushboo, everything that everybody's um, interjected with, it's, it's been very rich and um, just very, very rich. And I, I try to live my life to always try to find the good in whatever life presents me and whatever situations I'm in. And um, as, as much as I felt pain in listening to, to your story, you know, and, you know, just the loss of a, of a childhood, loss of a family, um, I can relate to that in many ways. But to listen to that pain, I could, I could feel your pain. I could almost touch it because it allowed me to see pieces of myself. And, um, and, and I, I see that as a gift that you've given. And so I just, I just really want to thank you for that. And uh, wow. I'm just, I feel overwhelmed. Thank you for sharing that. That really helps me, uh, you know, process the expo feeling of exposure <laughs> that I'm having. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, of course it's, Thank you. of course it's not the job of a 10 year old to decide whether to stay or to go. And so, you know, the fact that, that your mother, you know, asked you that and so on, she was, she was expressing, it seems to me, her pain and trying to find a way to get it outside of her, herself. Um, and you were, you were just there, you were, uh, sort of collateral damage in a way. Um, and, but, you know, in the end, uh, you know, it really, at 10 years old, it wasn't your job to decide whether to stay or go. I think you must have heard that from some <laughs> analysts or something over the years, I suppose. Yes, every week. <laughs> every week. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> you know, when I went through my analysis, I five, six, seven times over the years, there, there's this particular thing that he stopped and he said to me, and, okay, yeah, okay, that's right, you know, but it was the seventh or eighth time I heard it. I finally heard it. And that was it. I, I didn't need to be in analysis anymore. It's, it's really amazing how people can say things over and over and finally you get it. I, that was my experience, yeah. I think I just really regretted uh, it so much because of the magnitude of the experience I had. Uh, in addition to I, the guilt I felt for my siblings and my projective identification with them, uh, but I, I know that I, uh, it's just hard to wrap one's mind around it, really. But I. I would just daydream about flying back home like every night. I walked through that house like a ghost, mm -hmm. like, remote, like remote viewing, you know? I really, I did. And, and I think that's what kept me uh, connected to my culture too. For example, I speak very fluent Farsi and many people that have been here for 30 years and have had such trauma, they don't even want to speak the Farsi sometimes because it, it, it literally evokes the pain of the loss of the, the, the one's land. 
and, and culture, or, or they just have two personalities when they speak Farsi or when they speak English. Um, and they're full of blooded Iranians, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, and I felt, I, I felt very, very connected to my, my, uh, Iranian heritage. Um, and just kept it alive. And any person that I'm best friends with, or I'm in an intimate relationship with is, you know, been Iranian. And I've continued to find Iranian families to sort of burrow um, and, you know, eat that Iranian food and hear those, those songs and, and, you know, all of that. I mean, there were times where I'd, you know, fall asleep crying, you know, and missing you know, my family and my dad and all of that. But I, but I told myself I was still going to keep, stay connected. I wasn't going to allow this to cause me distance from my, from my um, Persian heritage. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you, is your father still alive now? Yes, he's alive. He's in Iran and he just so badly wants to come here and be here now. And, you know, now his parents are deceased and, he just want, wants to see his children, um, uh, but it's hard for him to function here. It's hard to say why, but he's like a kid in a candy store. I mean, now that he's older, it should be a little bit different, but we've been having a, just a heck of a time trying to get him here because my mom and dad are no longer married and we have to reapply and they just find all these ways of denying him. Um, to come and it's just like a compounding tragic because we we just want some closure all of us we just want some we just want to be under one roof and you know have our dad cook dinner for us and you know just hang out all of us you know and be together would um, your mother be part of that yeah she would i mean she has like a very flip floppy feeling towards my dad you know sometimes she'll cry for him and miss him and just the culture and some of the good things they had. And then other times she's like, I don't have anything to do with him. I'm not talking to him right now, mm -hmm. but uh, this, and they, neither of them remarried, neither of them remarried and they've just mm -hmm. suffered with, you know, being singletons uh, in, in one in America, one in Iran. And I think it would be more of a, you know, a, a just the kind of happiness of seeing that both of their children, you know, having that, that sort of, you know, we're all together, you know, and because my dad didn't, doesn't have any of us. He just has, he just has his, had his parents and his siblings, but, you know, he feels out of the loop, you know, uh, he doesn't get to see us grow up. He doesn't get to see my nephew, you know, grow up and. He was, he really was good with, with kids, you know, when, when he's close to them, but when they become older, or, you know, he's away, he, he doesn't, he's suffers. Do you, do you get to talk to him on uh, zoom or something like that or Skype? I haven't, he and I are in another phase where for the first time in all of these 30 years, I've decided to not accommodate his, you know, um, blind spots. Mm -hmm. And I've taken a stand like, like what I should have done, you know, before where no, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I'm doing me right now. And I want you to attend to, to that. And if he doesn't agree with certain aspects of my lifestyle, um, I, you know, there should be a degree of respect. And, and in fact, I want him to actually apologize for certain things because he does not want to admit, he literally has blocked the event that caused this tragedy. He doesn't want to even, you know, like acknowledge, recognize, or even explain or defend or remember, or I don't know what it is. So I, this time I'm just, I'm just, I, I'm holding him really accountable. And so we have, we're, you know, sometimes we don't talk, you know, on purpose and we talk through my sister or like, if we're worried about each other or we're checking on each other, but we're like having this, you know, we call it bad and Farsi where you're like not talking, 
It's like a yeah. thing you're you're like stonewalling each other to, you know, make a point. Um, mm. And my uh, new analyst uh, is trying to get me to break out of that headspace. He's like, it just you. you it's, it sounds like you're acting like an old Iranian man by <laughs> by saying you must submit to me and apologize. And uh, he's been trying to really, you know, get me to see that that's not useful. But I, my other, my first analyst kind of was like, you know, he went on the side of my defense. You need to, you know, this is this is your first time and putting your foot down, and you know that you know don't you know uh, if you don't want to betray yourself, don't you know? At least you have options. You can choose how you want to interact with him but he's getting older and you know i get worried about that too and so i've been sending him some in fact i sent him thanks to everybody here i sent him my dream and guess what he sent me he sent me a response not verbally but he sent me a video of a city that was found in iran that was underground an underground city with 80 entrances Wow. Yeah. And because I said, I said in my associations, it's like, I can't go home because the city's been buried and a new roads have been put on it. Mm. And so he sent me a video of an underground city that was mm. discovered. Interesting. Yeah. That's Sandy, it makes me wonder, as you talk about your father, how much of that is just general male stupidity and how much of it is cultural. Do you have a sense of that, of how different an Iranian man is from, from like an American man? Yes, uh, saying sorry is like death. Okay. And um, he's just so uh, um, in his anxiety, in his own, you know, um, narcissistic state, state that, uh, that he, he has an even harder time to hear what you're saying. Um, he also gets really cerebral, but, but, you know, he also can be, you know, defensive and go into denial of an intellectual debate. You know, he intellectually insulted me a couple of years ago when I made some comment and, it was below the belt and I, my feminine, my femininity was, you know, injured. My, my female status was, you know, injured and by my own father calling me a particular name. Um, and I didn't talk to him. And this was after my nephew was born. I didn't talk to him for a year and a half. And that's when I felt the closest to him finally, because of the, my nephew being born and all those original attachment figures coming out for me, my memories and needing him to sing songs to my nephew, needing him to, needing my nephew to hear my dad's voice so badly. And then I think he just was sad that I didn't have a kid yet and said some things and then I said some things and then, you know, something was said and I was very injured by this and we didn't talk for a long time. And he later told my, a psychoanalyst colleague, friend of mine, who's Iranian, who went to Iran and went to go visit my dad because he was having health problems. And he said, tell Ghazal, it was an intellectual argument. It was a, I was making a hypothetical intellectual, you know, it was a debate. I wasn't calling her a name, you know? So he like tried to weasel out of, you know, uh, back, he just backpedaled. <laughs> I'm like, no, you, <laughs> You can't, you know, rationalize what you said. Right. Well, um, uh, I've got a question. Go uh, yeah, go ahead. It, it kind of relates back to Tim's question in terms of cultural upbringing. Do you think that or ever considered that he does not have the capacity to change because of that upbringing? And if that were true, what would you do? Uh, that's That was my feeling about it, you, you have obviously have a connection of wanting a family, you know, and you've, as I see it, you've done 
quite well in trying to to get this family going, you know, because mm-hmm. that's a need for you. Uh, yeah. But but if he has, doesn't have a capacity to change, you might just have to accept that. Uh, that's just my <laughs> feeling. So yes, yes, I I think I have kind of reached that um, insight, but I you know, after my nephew was born, I think I kind of regressed even in my analytic progress some because of the return of this sort of more because of my attachment to my nephew, a new baby, you know, uh, and it made me a lot more vulnerable and I was not able to think, um, I wasn't able to be, I wasn't able to mentalize the situation well uh, at the time because I was, I didn't have my cerebral capacities anymore. And I was, I was just so, you know, I was like one of those, you know, moms that's super attached and worried about their baby and no, nothing else matters. And I need support and I want support. And why am I not getting support? So that I was, it was a return of the original trauma and I had a hard time being able to be understanding of my dad's shortcomings uh in 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 the way that i had already acquired that understanding um but i think i'm feeling better uh about this my new analyst and what i'm hearing from you is you know i can't be fighting emotionally with someone who just doesn't get it i think in my dream where i was acting like yunus and i was walking like yunus emery that dervish that was going back to his town in the in the show that I watch, I felt like I was like my dad too. That I was me and my dad, and that I was walking up to this house, my the new house that was built over the old house, or the old house was you know truly it really has been taken down and a new one has been built, and so I it was like I'm tr- I'm I'm trying I'm seeing what my dad is seeing like the new house. There's no women. It's empty. The feminine energy is no longer there except there's this seven month old baby blonde hair, which by the way, I, that's when I went to Iran, I was like seven or eight months old and I had little blonde hair. And, and so I think I was encountering myself as an infant, but it was a new Iran. And I was feeling like myself and my dad, like I, in a way I wanted him to see what I'm seeing and I want to see what he's seeing. And so my analyst just thought that was just so great because you know, he was trying to get us to see eye to eye, or at least get me to have that peaceful feeling that there, there is some way of having seeing eye to eye if, if I just let go of, you know, or that I do long for that. One, one thing that Dr. Jung seems to have suggested is that a lot of transformations, we'll call them growing up, but they go on throughout life, but a lot of them take a pretty long time. Okay, in other words, you know, you're in a certain place right now for yourself, but understanding that your father is also in a certain place for himself. And, and those transformations that, you know, weave back and forth, it's like the caduceus with the two snakes weaving back and forth, Um, you know, they, they may intersect again at some point and they may not, Um, but we, we have to keep living our lives nonetheless. Um, And um, the, well, I mean, lots of people have uh, problems with siblings, right? And so in my case, I've had a problem with my sister since I, since she was 17 and I was uh, 21 or something like that. Um, and uh, we've gone back and forth over the years in different ways, uh, but you know we're currently estranged and we haven't really talked for a decade or so. Um, and uh, there are a variety of reasons for that, but you know, not the least of which was she had <laughs> she had brain surgery. But uh, 
you know, I, I don't rule out the possibility that we might, um, you know, get back together again, okay, at some point in the future. Um, and, you know, I just, unfortunately, I don't know if, if she's capable of doing it because of, of the changes that went on in her brain that are permanent changes, but, um, but, um, you know, it's a, it's certainly a regret of my life, I would say, but it's, it's, uh, it's one that I can't let hold me back. I have to go on doing other parts of my life, right? And, um, you know, I, I won't bother you with it in detail now in terms of what happened, but, you know, these things happen and it, and it does take time to, you know, for you to go through the changes you need to go through and him to go through the changes he needs to go through. And those are going to happen whether or not you interact with it, right? So, I mean, I, when I first started to study young, I, I didn't really understand the significance of of symbols of transformation and what it meant. Um, and, uh, you know, now I think I have an idea about it anyway, in general terms. Um, but, you know, you, you need to anyway go on with your life, no matter what happens with your father, obviously. And, uh, you know, if you can get them over here, so much the better. I guess you'll have to wait until after next January, though. <laughs> well, and there's sanctions. There were sanctions. Right. That they can't even leave or anything like that. Yeah. So you're saying even other countries won't let Iranians come? Well, other countries could, but, you know, he needs to get here. <laughs> yeah. I understand. Yeah, because I, I have seen a lot of Iranians in in Dubai, for example. I've never been to Iran myself, but I've been it would just there. be hard to lug everybody to some other location temporarily. We just want to have them under our, you know, roof for a little while. Sure, sure. Well, that's tough. It's very hard. It's also interesting right now with the whole, you know, lockdown, because it just reminds me of when we were during the war, when we were having to stay put somewhere in a shelter and really be in the here and now collectively. Uh, there was something I really liked about it. And I think it was the, the fact that people aren't running around doing other things and they're all together. Mm -hmm. And there's so much richness that can happen when you're just in the here and now and you're just together. Yeah, surely. And, uh... and I'm remembering those experiences. And I, the, the only other time I felt this way was when I went to um, three group relations conferences. <clears throat> and group relations is done by this, you know, it was originally by this analyst, Wilford Beyond who created these work groups. Um, but essentially you're in a room with, you're in a few different rooms with 50, 60 different people and you're to do nothing but to be in the here and now for five, six days. And boy, the dynamics that unfold, the shadow work, the leadership, the roles that people take up, the the valences that people have, the identifications, the pairing, the assumptions, uh, this, the, this, the group psychosis. I mean, it's like by the day four, you feel like you took DMT or something, even <laughs> though you're doing nothing but just be together in the room. I mean, you start to see synchronicity starts happening faster and faster and faster and faster and more and more. And you start to think like you're, you're literally like, there's like an altered state of reality and, but a lot of psychic work gets done with folks as the, it can also be traumatic uh, for some who, you know, you're, you're basically breaking open the unconscious and, you know, it's, 
extreme exposure. And then you have to close it back up and say goodbye to all those people. And that really felt like that experience I had where my role was like a therapist role. I took up a, a therapist role very organically. And I was like, we can't leave a soldier behind. I don't want anybody getting traumatized in this group. So I was just working through the night trying to metabolize affect for different people mm -hmm. in the group. And I was so drained by the end that I know it was the bug bites in New Orleans, but it looked like I had stigmata. <laughs> okay. Interesting. I, mean, I was like, what was this called? What was this conference called? It's called group relations. So there's the Tavistock one and then there's, A.K. Rice, The Study of Social Systems. If you look up Wilford Beyond, uh, this and or, you know, um, group relations, uh, there's a few different organizations, um, one in, U in the UK and in LA and uh, in Chicago and different places. I can send you the information, but it's, uh, you know, they study group dynamics and it's like, it's like, very complex and interesting it, they they kind of like have like some leadership training involved in it too but when i had when i went through these three different three different conferences that's when i realized that the the war felt like the here and now um and 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 war is like a here and now you are in the here and now and you are nowhere else oh, yeah. and <laughs> and and i and i think that i think that some i think that society actually sometimes needs to be in the here and now and unconsciously they they produce some kind of response to push the system into a here and now and 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 to and to do the work you know mm -hmm. that needs to be done uh or to or to stop distracting because if you're in a room for s five days with 60 people uh doing nothing you're, you're not distracting yourself by work and this and that you're in the you're you're trying to just be present and only talk about what's happening in the room with you and what's coming up for you and what's coming out of you even if it's like i hate you i don't like the way you're looking at me or whatever it is it's just primitive here and now uh it's just remarkable what on un can unfold i'm sorry this, this is funny <laughs> yeah i i no, but just listening to you explain it, I'm sorry. I'm I'm finding some humor in it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's it's um, um, fascinating. Yeah, I, I can see it I can see an SNL segment there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Um, uh, group therapy in isolation. Yeah. But um, Sandy, I just have to say you're such a remarkable lady, uh, just absolutely remarkable. And um, I see a lot of um, strong uh, divine feminine in you. And um, you present just present um, with a strong mother archetype too. So oh, I'm, really? pretty, I'm sure, pretty sure you are aware of that, right? I'm, yeah, I'm aware of it. Uh, you know, I just don't want to, I, I can also become a ball busting one too. So I don't always get complimented for being that <laughs> as such. <laughs> you know, I could, I could lift a car if, you know, need be, <laughs> you know, if somebody's in harm's way, <laughs> you know, you know, that. Uh, almost all mothers can do that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> under the right circumstances. Yeah. So it's, quite enhanced and I work with children so I I'm I'm I'm, I'm I have these long-term relationships with children of all ages in my practice you know and their parents so I have to I have to be I have to take the containing function uh on my on my in, in me and and it, it's 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 really like it comes really easy it's very natural it's I'm very I don't feel drained I feel more energized you know when I'm working with children and parents and you know you know all of that you know my thought my thought is that everything from um the time you were born till now just prepared you for your lifetime work and all this um you know pain and agony and suffering that you went through uh you know you bear the fruits of all that labor and now you're putting it to 
good use, you know, as um, uh, just an awesome, awesome therapist that you bring to the table for the children, the, the families, and um, you're, doing, you're doing good work. You're doing the higher self spiritual work that um, whether you know it or not, but you just keep doing it and you keep giving. And that's sometimes the part of the pain too, is when you give too much and then you got to, uh Oh, oh I got to back off yeah. and yes. uh, enough is enough. And you got to figure that out. And that's a individual um, discernment that you have to yeah. work that out. You know, mm -hmm. you know, my dad said to me a couple of months ago, you know, because I don't have children right now. And, uh, and he said, stop sublimating and have a kid. <laughs> <laughs> And sublimation is like the highest defense you could have. Uh, and I, you know, I just, what a freaking backhanded compliment. Like just, oh. Um, hey, you know what? Anna, Anna Freud didn't have kids either. And she yeah. became a super therapist. Look, I'm not, I don't have any kids either. So my babies, my children are my, my patients. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I love them. And yeah. so, um, you know, we were cut out for this kind of stuff. And you know, so it, it's a I, curse and it's a blessing. I, I think as a mother, I think you guys are far more objective than I can be. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that's only because of the time boundary and the space boundary. <laughs> yeah. I, so I just want to ask whether Mir Mirtis or uh, Karen has have anything that they would like to say. Are are you good, Mirtis, or you would like to say something? I think um, <clears throat> everyone just um, managed to say anything that I thought about saying. Okay. I'm just thankful for. Sandy for sharing her story, for being part of this group. I'm really grateful. Thank you. Yeah, me too. Yeah, thank you. Karen, did you have anything you wanted to say or observe? Oh, well, I enjoyed listening to your story, even though, you know, it was... I don't know if enjoyable was the right is the right word to describe it, but it was very interesting and also everyone's comment. Um, it sounds like you know there's a lot of therapists and counselors in the group, and so it was interesting um, the feedback that was given, and um, yeah, it's I I got a lot out of it, so I really appreciate your sharing from the heart too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nancy, did you have anything more you wanted to say here? Well, I just uh, admire you so much, Sandy. Uh, I can't remember what program we were doing together and who was the speaker, but you were so excited to talk uh, shop with this guy. Oh, yeah, Dr. Bishop. Dr. Bishop, and I just saw you sparkle and just uh, come alive, having someone who could speak at your level. And uh, <laughs> yes. you are, you are, you know, you are a wounded healer. Sure. <laughs> so, Sandy, I, I want to uh, wrap this up by asking you and in the especially in the context of this quote but i i'd like to ask you what you think this session has meant to you but uh at the same time i i just want to make put the context with this quote that uh dr young uh said and and dr ashok Beatty is has it in his essay that we're going to be looking at in the morning. Um, but uh, the quote is this, I conceive it to be the duty of everyone who isolates himself by taking his own path of individuation to tell others what he has found or discovered, whether it be a refreshing spring for the thirsty or a sandy desert of sterile error. 
the one helps, the other warns. And so I wonder what you would say sort of in closing <laughs> with that prompt and, and whatever else you might want to say. Okay. I, uh, it, it, it really resonates for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, I don't know how to, how, in what, in what way it resonates, but in, in You're every saying the verse, quote, the quote resonates. Yes. Uh -huh. It resonates for me uh, in, in, the, in my experiences that I've had. Um, but I, I do want to say that my attempt to share this with you is part of a turning point for me that I have been anticipating and have not found the right moment or the place to um, make it more public, which is in fact what I've been wanting to do. I, I had in my mind, even I went to, into analysis because I thought it would help me write a memoir. Mm -hmm. And when I first came here, I told myself, I will, it was a defense in my mind, but I said, I am going to, write this up mm -hmm. and that gave me the strength to continue but it has always been a fantasy to do that and i haven't felt had the courage or the readiness or the or the kind of overall sort of climax and kind of closure to to produce it and to bring it out and i'm so incredibly excited and so incredibly grateful that i i gave myself that that gift finally and, and taking that first step and it might even just be enough, you know, for me, because, you know, this is going to be on YouTube. It's I'm hearing it from you and it, I put it out there. I mean, that's a huge, I have been wanting to give birth to it. Yeah. What I've heard about, like, for example, memoir writing is, you know, you could write 20 different memoirs sure. about 20 different times in your life. And I, I know that I have used the the narrative in my mind like a memoir as a as a kind of containing defense against extreme pain and vulnerability that I was going to, you know, write this up like a piece of art and um and, and and I and I it's not so important for me anymore because of the other things in my life but I've been wanting to get back to doing it and um and I think that's the same as any other thing you're trying to process. I could write a book about uh, at different relationships I've had and I, that I haven't metabolized fully, you know, and, mm -hmm. and well, I, the, I think about that, but it's so overwhelming, you know? Yeah. Well, the, certainly the red book is Dr. Jung's example for the rest of us. He said in, in Thomas Arf's essay, he, he said uh, that, you know, you should make your own red book. And when, whenever you go back to it, um, that'll be your temple. I probably can find the actual quote here. It's, um, it's quite powerful. I, I was wondering what others thought about the, the Jung, Jung's quote. Well, what it brings to mind for me is a, a couple of things. Um, taking those steps into unconscious material into into, into dream depth stuff um, even though I've been there many times one thing I would say is the path is never the same twice um, and I can only see it a step ahead maybe not even that far I have to just take that step and then take the next one and take the next one um, and that's the work that's the process. Right. I enjoy it, but it, sometimes it's emotionally intense. Mm. Yeah. So um, I'll just read this little section. It's on page 36 of, uh, let's see, volume one of Jung's Red Book for Our Time. But it says, 
in seeking to assist a patient in finding a way to her individuation process and the rediscovery of soul, Jung recommended creating a personal red book. Quote, I should advise you to put it all down as beautifully as you can in some beautifully bound book. It will seem as if you were making the visions banal, but then you need to do that. Then you are freed from the power of things. If you do that with the, these eyes, for instance, they will cease to draw you. You should never try to make the visions come again. Think of, think of it in your own imagination and try to paint it. Then when these things are in some precious book, you can go back to the book and turn over the pages. And for you, it will be your church, your cathedral the silent places of your spirit where you will find renewal. If anyone tells you that it is morbid or neurotic and you listen to them, then you will lose your soul, for in that book is your soul. And the, unquote. Then he says, your cathedral, one's own church, is the Ecclesias, Ecclesia Spiritualis. This is the pressing issue today, according to Jung. We are in a period of turbulent transitions in an interim of history. However, just how postmodern radical plurality and incarnatio continua are entangled with each other remains a mystery. Perhaps this logical contradiction is the sign of a deeper truth. Even, it, even, even if it took centuries, as Jung suspected, before the new God would the new God image would constitute itself. The new collective myth already is delineated and the individual consequently called upon to actively contribute to the foundation of a new religion in the form of an invisible church. As this is described in a dream and during an ensuing talk of Max Seller with Jung himself, quote, a temple of vast dimensions was in the process of being built. As far as I could see ahead, behind, right, and left, there were incredible numbers of people building on gigantic pillars. I too was building on a pillar. The whole building process was in its very first beginnings, but the foundation was already there, and the rest of the building was starting to go up and I and many others were working on it." Unquote. Jung said, yes, you know, that is the temple we all build on. We don't know the people because believe me, they build in India and China and Russia and all over the world. That is the new religion. You know how long it will take until it's built? I said, how should I know? Do you know? He said, I know. I asked how long it will take. He said, about 600 years. Where do you know this from? I asked. He said, from dreams, from other people's dreams and from my own. This new religion will come together as far as we can see. Okay, so, so, wow. end, so end of the reading for today. But, um, you know, the, the point is uh, suddenly, uh, we are seeing that we're all in, on the same leaky boat, okay? Everybody in the world. This coronavirus is the first thing that is affecting everybody in the world simultaneously. And, um, and you know, every human being on the planet that knows about it, um, you know, is we're all reliant on the same small cadre of people who know how to create a vaccine. Um, we're all really all dependent on those people. And, um, you know, wherever we are in the world. And um, so things are going to change. They're, they've changed so much in my lifetime. I, I, I just, and it's accelerating all the time, but this is a real accelerator here. Uh, this coronavirus situation. It's going to change us profoundly, I think. Um, so, 
anyway, um, that was from Thomas Arce's article, and uh, that's why I th I've always thought it it was such a profound article. It's it's thirty five pages long, but it's just filled with with insight that's quite incredible. Uh, so, Tim, do you want to say anything further here, or anybody else? Well, Sandy, I'm just really touched. I feel so lucky to have heard your story, and thank you so much for sharing it. There's something that's, that's just remarkably intimate about hearing somebody's um, tale like that, and I just don't know how to thank you. It's really beautiful. Yeah. And uh, next uh, Saturday night, we have, uh, Nicole has said that she'll tell us her story, and it's also quite, a, quite an incredible one. Um, you, you won't believe the things that happened to her. Um, she's over, I, I'd say over the last year, she's told me bits and pieces of it, and um, it's, it's quite an incredible story. I don't, I don't want to steal her thunder, but it's, uh, it's, will definitely be worthwhile being here next, uh, next Saturday night. Um, and, uh, so tomorrow we have, uh, Dr. Ashok Beatty and, uh, is Kushbu here still? So this is going to be the Hindu, uh, the Hindu approach to the Red Book. And uh, mm. so, so Kushbu will be in her element, I think. It'll be a good one, I think. So Kushbu, do you wanna give us a prayer here? Yes, yes. Uh, with the with the very last comment, um, thank you, Sandy. You are thank you, Gazal. You are very, very, very beautiful. Just like my love for Gazal. Thank <laughs> you. Beautiful. Very thank beautiful. you so much. Um. So the last thing I want to. So I was having a like I had a had a call with Searchscape. Uh, yesterday morning, I think yesterday morning, yeah. and um, so he mentioned uh, uh, about golden threat that that we are building in our life, and I have a I have a spelling problem. My English writing is very primitive, and I think I think when uh, when Sir Tim speaks, it it just become very alive that it is very primitive. But anyways, that's the uh, another journey of mine but um, but when i wrote up wrote that golden threat i while you were talking and while i opened the same book i realized that i have written golden treat <laughs> and um like i i feel like how this, that unconscious works there so it's, it's it's a golden treat to i feel nourished i feel nourished um, thank you so much. It is a golden treat to be able to witness this, to be able to hear this. And, and well, you inspired me, um, and I just was so amazed that I had not thought about your name in the Farsi language. You know, and I was, I just, I got electrified when I realized the meaning, and it's like a Farsi word and I was like oh my gosh like I was like I felt like I had you know found a friend in my own you know country that knows my language just the the names you know you knew you were telling me about my name and I was asking you about the meaning of your name and I it dawned on me that you know it's like you a yeah, I was like, oh my goodness, I just like... So, re reminded the rest of us, because that got right by me. Oh, uh, Kushbu and I had a phone conversation, and she said, oh, I can't believe your name is Azal, you know, wow, I was so neat, you know, and I said, thank you, thank you, thank you, and 
by the way, what does your name mean? And she's like, fragrance. And I'm like, oh, yeah, boo oh, means yeah. the smell in Farsi. And because hu you were saying kush boo. And I was like, oh, my goodness, this is, you know, and it was it was like just amazing to know the meaning of her name in my own language. Kush means happy. So yeah. technically Hush. I'm supposed to be. Kush, yeah. yes. yes. So I'm a happy fragrance. Happy yes. fragrance. my name. <laughs> Yeah. And when I when I told my mother about you, uh, and I said, "Mom, I didn't think about it," and I realized her name means Khushbu, and she was my mom had the same reaction. She was like, "Oh my goodness," you know. So that interesting. Was, that was neat. Very neat. Very neat. Yeah. Like the happy fragrance. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try anyway. to remember that one this next time. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, let's um, let's gather our energy, let's gather our powers, and let's pray for the happiness of the world and all the worlds and happiness of all the people of all the world. Um, uh, Loka Samasta Sukhino Bhavantu Loka Samasta Sukhino Bhavantu Loka God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, Kushbu. So, Kushbu, I'm I'm going to ask you whether um, we can sing this in rounds now, because I've I've now memorized this uh, mantra, and I think I could sing it. I don't know about anybody else, but uh, yeah, yeah, sure. I would love that. I would love that, and I'm here whenever I'm needed. <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm just wondering if anybody else is up for trying. You might have to go back and and look at the words again on the on the uh, video that I made just of of uh, Kushbu's prayer. But it would it would be frustrating because of the delay. That that's all I have to. No, I, that, I've yeah, tried you, that's right and <laughs> and we, we were having that problem in the buddhist group and so we each have to we have to take turns and do it uh, for the, for those that are able to do it or willing or interested in doing it let's put it that way um but i i think i'm i'm ready and anyone else and so push could start and we would take turns uh, so that that's my thought anyway if you want, if you want to if others want to try to um, so i love that thought and um, 
I think we should make this a practice when once like all of our group members because it's a it's a very very powerful experience to to sing it with the with the meaning with with the awareness of meaning and uh, personally like, like you being the voice of bringing uh, happiness and prosperity um, for that moment for the for, for for the world and all the worlds that exist and all the people of the worlds that exist it is a it is a very powerful experience and i i invite all of you to try it out please yeah. so um so that's the challenge for everybody we'll think about that for next time um, maybe uh kushbu and ashok and i can do it tomorrow <laughs> sure uh, we'll see. So, and we'll we'll see who else volunteers. <laughs> so, um, Josh, oh, I wanted to. I just wanted to see if this works. If I stop my video, look at that, Josh. Can you see? Yes, I see. You've got your aloha mask on. Right, Josh oh. sent me. Just. Uh, so I, I just had to, I had to show Joss that we started to use these gifts, which are aloha masks. Um, and, uh, so, uh, we, but tomorrow's session is two hours later, Joss, so you can sleep in until seven if you, if you want to join us. I hope you can. <laughs> so, All right. Yeah. Well, so. aloha, everybody. Okay. One o'clock tomorrow, East, U.S. Eastern Time. Ten o'clock Pacific Time. Uh, ten a.m. Pacific Time. And for Kushbu, it's ten thirty at night. I apologize for that, Kushbu. Take a nap before. Take take a nap this afternoon. Okay. Peace. Take care now, everybody. Bye bye. 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 Thank you.